Welcome to the Ethical Humanist Society of Long Island. It's great to see you all. I hope you're all doing well. A special welcome to our visitors, both new and frequent. We hope you'll return next week. To contact the society at another time, just go to ehsli.org. Everyone, please remember that the program is being recorded and you will be muted. If you need to get up while it's in progress, please shut off your video so it won't be a distraction to others. Putting your phone on vibrate might not be a bad idea either. So let's get started. Ethical humanism, also called ethical culture, is dedicated to the proposition that every person is to be respected and that in an ethical world, each of us makes a unique contribution to the common good. We believe that nothing should be more important to people than people. Our future requires a deep faith, faith not in authority, but in the promise of humanity. Today, we're having a special program which will focus on the power of poetry to touch our hearts and wake us up. If you attend our meetings regularly, you know that our weekly poem is usually short, but over the years, I found another, a number of longer poems which I've really wanted to share. Most of these works are powerful reflections of our culture, both past and present, but a couple of them are poems of imagination and imagery. So with the help of some of our friends, that's what you'll hear today. Kelly will start us off with a lovely piece of music called, If Only I Knew Your Name. Kelly? Good morning, everyone. The um, piece of music is called, If I Only Knew Your Name, and it was written by Leslie Stoller, who was the music director of Ginger's The Adventure of Gingerella. I'd like to read the words because it's played instrumentally. If I only knew your name, if I only knew your name, I won't harm you, I won't hurt you, I would love you if I only knew your name. We are different on the outside, but inside we're the same. I could love you, I could like you if I only knew your name. Stop running, sweet stranger, stop running away. I promise I won't leave you, I promise to stay. I will walk closely beside you. Please don't run away. I won't harm you. I won't hurt you. I would love you if I only knew your name. Walk beside me for a while. Share your story for a while. I'm not scary, only frightened until you know my name. Look inside my eyes and see how much we are the same. We are different. Oh, so different. We are different. Oh, so different until you know my name. Would you learn my name? Here it comes. Thank you. 
you, Kelly. Our first poem is entitled 1918, Eva Describes Her Deathbed. It was written by Leanne Howe, a contemporary Native American poet. Ms. Howe wrote this poem based on the story her grandmother told her about surviving the 1918 pandemic after she and her husband of one year got sick with dreaded illness. The poem will be read by Lorraine Agostino and Kim Lepresti. No, it wasn't like that. You didn't see. He was lying quietly, mouth shut, one hand on his chest, the other frozen mid stir. We were beside one another when they found us. Beside, what a wonderful word. Beside is the scent I carry. Beside the first man I touched and his touching me. Beside him when I woke fully awake. John said, I hear something, our baby perhaps, or a kitten crying for a saucer of milk, a kitten crying because she is lost, because she is forsaken, because she is left alive. No, not the cat, me. Give me your hand, John. Together we'll catch a mess of perch Cut the canes and load the wagon. We'll have the folks over for supper. Just a half day's rag and wide away. Not far. Give me your hand, dearest. Last fall, we helped build the Bing Post Office, named in honor of Sir Julian Bing, a British World War I hero. Your father had a conniption. You, an Irishman, putting an Englishman forward. Give me your hand, Johnny boy. I call you home now, and I call you home tomorrow, a thousand times as our bodies flake into stars, mad or sane. Get up, John Hoggett. You can't stay in this deathbed. You can't. Walk on, Iva, says John softly. Walk on my girl, said John, my girl, my. Thank you. Our second poem is a lovely one called the Sun Went Down in Beauty, and was written by George Marion McClellan, a nationally known African-American poet who was born in 1860 and died in 1934. It will be read by Arthur Dobrin and Joan Beter. The sun went down in beauty beyond the Mississippi side. As I stood, stood on the banks of the river and I watched its water glide, its swelling currents resembling the longing restless soul, surging, swelling, and pursuing its ever receding goal. The sun went down in beauty, but the restless tide flowed on and the phantom of absent loved ones danced on the waves and were gone. Fleeting phantoms of loved ones, their faces jubilant with glee, in the spray seemed to rise and beckon and then rush on to the sea. 
The sun went down in beauty while I stood musing alone, stood watching the rushing river and heard its restless moan. Longings vague, intenable, so far from speech apart, like the endless rush of the river went surging through my heart. The sun went down in beauty, peacefully sank to rest, leaving its golden reflection on the great Mississippi's breast gleaming on the turbulent river. In the coming gray twilight, soothing its restless surging and kissing its waters, good night. Thank you, Arthur and Joan. And now for some, for two very powerful poems. The next one will be read by Delory Cohen and Alicia Evans. Its title is Alabama Centennial. And it was written by Naomi Long Magid. She was an African-American poet who was born in 1923 in Virginia and died this past year after living in Detroit most of her adult life. <clears throat> Detroit made her the city's poet laureate in 2001, and she remained that until her death. She was an ardent civil rights activist, and this is reflected in her poetry. Another famous poem of hers is entitled Midway, well worth looking up. She wrote this poem, Alabama Centennial, in 1965, which was the 100th anniversary of the end of the Civil War. Delory and Alicia. They said, wait. Well, I waited. For 100 years, I waited. In cotton fields, kitchens, balconies, in bread lines, at back doors, on chain gangs in stinking colored toilets and crowded ghettos outside of schools and voting booths. And some said later, and some said never. Then a new wind blew, a new voice rode its wings with, with quiet urgency. Uh, it was strong, determined, sure. No, it said, not never. Not later, not even soon. Now, walk. And other voices echoed the freedom words. Walk together, children. Don't get weary. Whispered them, sang them, prayed them, shouted them, walk. And I walked the streets of Montgomery until a link in the chain of patient acquiescence broke. Then again, sit down. And I sat down at the counters of Greensboro. Ride, and I rode the bus for freedom. Kneel, and I went down on my knees and prayed in faith. March, and I'll march until the last chain falls, singing, we shall overcome. Not all the dogs and hoses in Birmingham. Nor all the clubs and guns in Selma. Can turn this tide. Not all the jails can hold these young black faces. From the destiny of manhood. Of equality, of dignity. Of the American dream. A hundred years past due. Now. Thank you. In August 1966, Bruce Hartford, a young Jewish American civil rights activist, wrote the following poem after seeing police and state troopers attack and tear gas a voter registration rally held in Grenada, Mississippi. Its title, appropriately enough, is Mississippi Voter Rally. The readers are Linda Joe, Frank Miller Small, Barbara Haber, and Mel Haber. 
hot, drippy evening, red and yellow bars of neon light. A crowd of dark shadows defiantly stand in the Mississippi night. Car roof buckles under the weight of silhouetted shadows against the neon. Courage and song rise up from the surrounding sea of unseen folk, engulfing us like a warm, friendly ocean. Helmets advance out of the dark, fearsome, their long false faces, hideous masks of death. A shouted command, choking fumes, explosions, screams, terror, can't breathe, can't see. The warm ocean scatters like spilled quicksilver, blindly running, blindly escaping. Clubs thud against fragile flesh as helmets leap out of the night, out of the agonizing, blinding fog to fall on helpless innocence. Quiet, echoing quiet. The damp Mississippi night closes in on homes strangely dark. Black shadows peer from dark windows as the Marsmen patrol their temporarily conquered territory. Boots echoing off stony-faced homes. Inside, in the dark, Human blast furnaces forge inner resolve. Hammers of anger pounding out determination. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And now some music from Kelly.
Thank you, Kelly. Aurora Levins Morales, the author of Child of the Americas, wrote this very personal poem about her heritage as a U United States Puerto Rican Jew. She was born in Puerto Rico, but grew up in the continental United States. She is known for her Latina feminism, but she identifies strongly with both of the backgrounds she comes from. This contemporary poet has led a rich and varied life as an author, poet, and teacher, and is the daughter of civil rights activists, Rosario Morales and Richard Levins. Yolanda Miller, Angeles Placer, and Alicia Hernandez, Yolanda's daughter, will read excerpts from this wonderful poem. I am a child of the Americas, a light-skinned mestiza of the Caribbean, a child of many diaspora born into this continent at a crossroads. Um, I am Caribeña, island grown. Spanish is my flesh. Ripples from tongue lodges in my hips. The language of garlic and mangoes, the singing of poetry, the flying gestures of my hands. I am Latino America, rooted in the history of my continent. I speak from that body. I am new. History made me. My first language was Spanglish. I was born at the crossroads and I am here. Thank you. <clears throat> Rupi Carr is a young contemporary poet whose family came from India <clears throat> and migrated to Canada when she was a child. Her poems relate mostly to youth and womanhood, and she's very popular on Instagram. But this poem that she wrote is about belonging. Dorcas Kiptu will read it for us. Dorcas. They have no idea what it's like to lose home at the risk of never finding home again, to have your entire life split between two lands and become the bridge between two countries. I'm sure this poem speaks to all of us, whether we're descendants of immigrants or immigrants ourselves. Thank you, Dorcas. One of our nation's premier poets, Carl Sandburg, was born into a poor Swedish immigrant family in 1878. His first book of poems was published in 1904 and he won his first Pulitzer Prize in 1919. In 1936, in the depths of the Great Depression, he sat down and wrote The People, Yes which is an epic prose poem of 300 pages. It was written, in his words, to console the people of the earth and the family of man. Sandberg believed that economic inequity is the root of social injustice. And these lines that will be read reflect a complicated people living in a complicated culture of the United States. Nine of our members are going to read an excerpt from this monumental work. Calvin Dame, David Sprinson, Chris Stanley, Pat Spencer, Ginger Hendler, Susan Pfeiffer, Wayne Outen, Alice Sprinson, and Sharon Stanley. The people 
Yes, the people will live on. The learning and blundering people will live on. They will be tricked and sold and again sold and go back to the nourishing earth for root holds. The people, so peculiar in renewal and comeback, you can't laugh off their capacity to take it. The mammoth rests between his cyclonic dramas. The people, so often sleepy, weary, enigmatic, is a vast huddle with many units saying, I earn my living. I make enough to get by and it takes all my time. If I had more time, I could do more for myself and maybe for others. I could read and study and talk things over and find out about things. It takes time. I wish I had the time. The people is a tragic and comic two-face. Hero and hoodlum, phantom and gorilla twisting to the moan with a gray gargoyle mouth. They buy me, they sell me. It's a game. Sometime, I'll break loose. Once having marched over the margins of animals' necessity, over the grim line of sheer substance, then came man. To the deeper rituals of his bones, to the dance, the song, the story, or the hours given over to dreaming, once having so marched. Between the finite limitations of the five senses and the endless yearnings of man for the beyond, the people hold to the humdrum bidding of work and food while reaching out when it comes their way for lights beyond the prison of the five senses, for keepsakes lasting beyond any hunger or death, this reaching is alive. The panderers and liars have violated and smutted it, yet this reaching is alive yet for lights and keepsakes. The people know the salt of the sea and the strength of the winds lashing the corners of the earth as a tomb of rest and a cradle of hope. Who else speaks for the family of man? They are in tune and step with constellations of universal law. The steel mill sky is alive. The fire breaks white and zigzag, shot on gunmetal gloaming. Man is a long time coming. Man will yet win. Brother may yet line up with brother. This old anvil laughs at many broken hammers. There are men who can't be bought. The fireborn are at home in fire. The stars make no noise. You can't hinder the wind from blowing. Time is a great teacher. Who can live without hope? In the darkness, with a great bundle of grief, the people march. In the night and overhead, a shovel of stars for keeps. The people march. Where to? What next? Thank you all. The next poem, which was suggested and will be read by Muriel Schwartzman, is actually the last stanza of a work called The Building of a Ship by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Longfellow was a patriot and an abolitionist. The main part of the poem, interestingly, is literally about the building of a ship. But the stanza you will hear, which is the last stanza, 
has become a metaphor for love of country and what it stands for. At the beginning of World War II, for example, Franklin Delano Roosevelt sent this piece to Winston Churchill, who often read it to his people as an inspiration to the beleaguered citizens. Muriel? Muriel, put your finger on the bar. I got it. I got it. Sail on, sail on, O oh ship of state. Sail on, O oh union, strong and great. Humanity, with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, is hanging breathless on thy fate. We know what masters laid thy keel, what workmen wrought thy ribs of steel, who made each mass and sail and rope, what anvils rang, what hammers beat, in what a forge and what a heat were forged the anchors of thy hope. Fear not each sudden sound and shock. Tis of the wave and not the rock. Tis but the flapping of the sail and not a rent made by the gale. In spite of rock and tempest roar, in spite of false lights on the shore, sail on nor fear to breast the sea. Our hearts, our hopes are all with thee. Our hearts, our hopes, our prayers, our tears, our faith triumphant all our fears are all with thee, are all with thee. Thank you, Muriel. Our final poem will be read by Judy Rose Marin. It's entitled, The Music of the Spheres, All Nine, by Holly Orwell. The theme is a departure from what you've been hearing, but I think its remarkable imagery reminds us that in spite of everything, our fears, our triumphs, our joys and sorrows, we are all but a small part of existence. Judy? There's no such thing as silence, only sound, ordered, graceful. The music of the spheres reverberates in every atom bounds from star to star, a song we can't quite hear except in hints and glimpses. In the hush of twilight, crickets with their tiny words or the subtle ebb and flow and rush of blood within our veins, more felt than heard. High circling gulls against the blue and sparrows darting quick into the hedge, the air before the rain and after, mossy bridges, furrows in farmers' fields, woven into the cosmic score, a secret song. And we, below the moon, can add our praises, evening, morning, noon. Thank you, Judy. So to end the program, I'd like us to listen to a, a very moving choral piece called Sing Gently Together. The singers from all over the world are led by Eric Whitaker.
Thanks, Kelly. I hope everybody loves that as much as I do. It's just marvelous. Anyway. So thank you to everyone who participated and helped out. A lot of people were involved in this and I greatly appreciated all of you who listened. I hope you enjoyed the program and it touched your hearts and woke you up. That was the purpose of it. Um, if anyone would like to stay afterwards to talk about the poetry you've heard, we can do that, but we have a few things to do before it. Uh, first, I'll read the closing words, which are by Martin Luther King Jr whose birthday is this month. And he said, and we've all heard this before, we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters. Well, I, I added the and sisters. <laughs> we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. <laughs>